Uh, if there were any delay, uh, it could only go today until 4.14 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That's called the window. Any time after that, they would not launch because of the uh, lack of uh, light uh, downrange where any recovery on a first orbit or, uh, uh, abort would have to take place. Uh, then, uh, if they couldn't go today, they would not go until Tuesday. That's so that the lighting conditions on the moon will be as exact as they can possibly make it uh, to, to the conditions in July for the actual landing. A, an announcement from Jack King and Launch Control. Uh, some cold helium into the engine chamber, the five engines in the second stage, to condition it uh, for later uh, during the powered flight when that uh, extremely cold hydrogen and oxygen meets in the engine chambers. We condition them for these extremely low temperatures over the final portions of the countdown itself. As a matter of interest, the target of the Apollo astronauts, uh, the moon, at launch time will be a distance of 218,528 miles. 218,528 nautical miles. We're coming up on T-minus 20 minutes and counting all aspects of the mission go. This is launch control. 218,000 nautical miles, that's about 243,000 statute miles, or the miles that uh, you and I use on Earth, the ones that your speedometer on the automobile click off. Uh, the moon is moving away from the Earth. Its orbit of the Earth is not exactly circular, uh, and it will be at almost its maximum, its uh, apogee from the Earth, uh, which is 252,100 miles. It'll be almost that far out when uh, these astronauts reach it on Wednesday. It'll be 248,000 miles out on Wednesday. helium into the engine chamber, the five engines in the second stage, to condition it uh, for later uh, during the powered flight when that uh, extremely cold hydrogen and oxygen meets in the engine chambers. We condition them for these extremely low temperatures over the final portions of the countdown itself. As a matter of interest, the target of the Apollo astronauts, uh, the moon, at launch time will be a distance of 218,528 miles. 218,528 nautical miles. We're coming up on T-minus 20 minutes and counting all aspects of the mission go. This is launch control. 218,000 nautical miles, that's about 243,000 statute miles, or the miles that uh, you and I use on Earth, the ones that your speedometer on the automobile click off. Uh, the moon is moving away from the Earth. Its orbit of the Earth is not exactly circular, uh, and it will be at almost its maximum, its uh, apogee from the Earth, uh, which is 252,100 miles. It'll be almost that far out when uh, these astronauts reach it on Wednesday. It'll be 248,000 miles out on Wednesday. There could be, uh, of course, things learned in this flight, things could go wrong in this flight, that would throw all of the planning off. That would mean that Apollo 11 would not go in July. What sort of things could be that serious that would discover on the flight of Apollo 10? Bruce Morton is at the manned spacecraft center in Houston and can tell us. Bruce? Well, uh, most of the scientific information needed for 11 is, uh, is already at hand, really. The mission planners, uh, the people we see here in mission control, have been plotting uh, trajectories to and from the moon for years. I talked the other day with one of the mathematicians who's been doing nothing but that ever since 1961. The lunar mappers have thousands of photographs. One said the other day, we know every rock in the landing site. In fact, we've literally counted them more than once. Their main interest on this flight is getting the astronauts to photograph some more remote parts of the moon, some of the mountainous areas where later landings might occur. So that kind of planning, the mathematics, the trajectories, the maps, uh, has been done, and this flight isn't likely to add much to it. What the mission planners are interested in is 10 as a physical rehearsal, finding out whether the astronauts can physically do all the things they need to in the time allowed, getting to and from the lunar module, for example, or whether there's some special problem in navigating around the moon that doesn't show up in a simulator. They're most concerned that the crew have plenty of practice with the lunar module. After all, only one of those has ever been flown with men in it before. And that really takes precedence in their thinking over getting to the moon. As you know, Walter, there are a number of alternate missions for Apollo 10, should something go wrong, should it fail to be injected on that course that takes it to the moon. Depending on how that burn goes, it could switch to a high elliptical orbit around the Earth or even a low orbit mission. 
On all of those, there are plans for working with the lamb, practicing rendezvous and so forth, and the planners say that that kind of a failure now would not rule out a moon landing next time, as long as the lem worked and as long as the astronauts had plenty of time to try it out. So it's really a rehearsal for the physical aspects of the moon landing flight, and if the hardware works, if everything goes the way it's supposed to, even if it all happens just in orbit around the Earth, the chances for a moon landing next time are still pretty good. It would take some, some major malfunction in the equipment to change the plans for Apollo 11. Walter? Bruce, as you know, we've got several critical points in any uh, space flight. First one is this liftoff of the 3,097-ton vehicle and payload with its million gallons of fuel, as we've said, aboard. Uh, the alternative to that, if anything went wrong, is a launch escape system, we said, which can pull the command module away, uh, hopefully before the explosive force takes over. And that's an automatic sensing device that would be blown away automatically. Uh, a sensing device that reacts faster than man reacts if he put his hand on a hot stove, uh, about twice as fast as that. And then uh, there's the critical matter of Earth orbital insertion. Uh, that's when they get up there uh, to that 118-mile altitude. Uh, do they reach the altitude at just the right speed to be suspended between the gravity of Earth and uh, flying on out into space? It's a speed of 17,400 miles an hour. They have to do it just right at that speed. That's the second critical moment. Then translunar injection. They've got to speed up to 25,000 miles an hour to get into the uh, exact speed to get out to the moon, but not go beyond the moon and swing out toward the sun, and that's got to be precise, and that's a, a very critical moment. Then transposition and docking when they come out and uh, reconnect to get the lunar module for the trip on out to the moon. That's critical. They've got to come in at just the right speed, just the right angle to avoid crashing together in a catastrophic collision in space. Uh, after uh, that uh, precise maneuver, they get out to the moon and the separation again of the lunar module, and then going down to that 10-mile altitude just above the lunar surface. That could be a highly critical moment. Uh, they haven't tested this equipment out there. In fact, the whole lunar module has only been tested once before in space and never in the environment of the moon with its peculiar one-sixth gravity and, and these uh, magnetic lumps and nodules that are somewhere under the surface of that moon. We don't really know what they are, but cause space flight around the moon to be rather irregular and somewhat bumpy. Well, at 10 miles, that could be kind of critical. Uh, then uh, the rejoining, that's a critical point. When they use the ascent engine of the spacecraft uh, from the descent stage and separate to go back and re-rendezvous with the command module, that's never been tested in space at all. Uh, that kind of fire in the hole, as they say, that'll be a first test and very critical. Then the firing of that 20,500-pound engine to come out of lunar orbit. If that's the only way they've got at that point, after they've uh, jettisoned the LEM, to come back, it's got to fire, and it's got to work. If it doesn't work, well, they're stuck in lunar orbit, and they've only got about uh, three or four days' supply of air and uh, food up there that would be quite a catastrophe. But uh, when that does fire, they're on the way home. And then the critical point, the separation for the service module, the re-entry into the Earth's uh, atmosphere, 25,000 miles an hour. The heat gets up to 5,000 degrees on the face of that spacecraft as they come in, and they must come in at just the right angle. They've just got about 7 degrees tolerance there. If they come in too shallow, they skip back out into the uh, into a high orbit around the Earth from which they can't get back at that point because they have only the command module and no power aboard it. Or if they come in too steeply, they'd be crushed in the sudden buildup of gravity and burned up as a meteor coming back into the Earth. And they've just got seven degrees about in that little tiny cone to come down. Uh, they'll be guided by computers. They've, been, they've done it before, uh, but it is a critical point. Then the parachutes have to open, of course, and they're back safely, presumably. So many critical points in this flight, and of course, these astronauts do think of the dangers of that. And as it's uh, now T minus 13 minutes and counting here, uh, we were going to talk of the dangers, and uh, the, the astronauts do. They don't duck them at all. Uh, they've been reminded of them on more than one occasion. The astronauts, of course, more aware of them than even we are. And David Schumacher recently asked Stafford and Young about the risk involved in this mission. Tom Stafford first. How would I assess the risk? Well, it's, uh, so it's the next one in line, and it's, it's, a, it's a big step. It's riskier than the ones before it. And uh, the, the ones that will be more riskier than mine will be the landing. Again, I hope if we do a, a good job on this, it will certainly reduce the, the risk on the landing mission. Oh, I tell you, I've been so uh, wrapped up in it, I think it, 
If the equipment works, uh, it'll be a successful mission. You know, there's a lot of things that if they don't work, you're not going to the moon. And, in fact, you, you may have to spend the night in Africa or something. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we're pretty, we're pretty uh, dependent on those things working properly, and there's not a great deal we can do if they don't work properly. And, uh, but the risk is uh, just not something you think about at the time, I don't think. You don't lie awake nights thinking about things that can go wrong? No, I, I lie awake light nights thinking about things that uh, if, if I uh, don't do them right might go wrong.